All right, folks. Hello and welcome. So glad to have you with us again today. This is our next live interview video in the IMAX Victoria live series that we are putting together uh, to allow you, our pass holders, and our patrons to go behind the scenes on some of your favorite IMAX films. Today, we are diving under the waves with Amelia McCartan, the director and underwater cinematographer for Sea Lions Life by a Whisker. Hello, Amelia. The underwater cinematographer, but yes. Okay, <laughs> correction. Yeah. Ignore that was, everything uh, I've said. The very, very talented Mr. John Shaw, but um, hello, hello everyone. Hello, the past holders. Really nice to be back there. I was just saying we were uh, there in person with Leah in November, but it seems like so long ago. But um, it was lovely to meet you all then and hopefully um, we'll be able to answer a few questions again. Definitely. It seems um, very strange that that was a whopping six months ago that we did <laughs> our behind the scenes look at the making of your film Sea Lions. Um, and as some folks will likely remember, we opened Sea Lions just a few short weeks before our temporary closure, which we are still in. Um, so I know some people have had a chance to see the film already. Some folks have had a chance to meet Amelia, which is so great. Um, so we're extending that a little bit today uh, for you in your homes. So Amelia, a little bit of, of context for you. Um, just we want to know a little bit more about you and, and your history making films, both giant screen and not giant screen. What brought you to filmmaking in the first place? How did you get here? Um, I think, you know, it's really nothing different to everyone else. I think there was a whole kind of generation that was really... Um, inspired by you know the David Attenborough series and um, all the work of the BBC Natural History you know the planet Earth and the blue planets um, etc and I think that they were probably really formative in a lot of wildlife filmmakers kind of early career choices <laughs> and definitely mine as well I think um, I was probably a little bit of the weirder uh, ones that were more interested in all the like reptiles and the creepy crawly episodes and stuff like that. But <laughs> they were definitely, you know, early on, I grew up in uh, a really tiny country town in landlocked um, Victoria, different Victoria. Other um, so of they the were really Victoria. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were um, kind of only my, ac my only access to, you know, other worlds and other animals apart from, you know, cows and horses. So <laughs> um, they were they were really important for me growing up. And uh, my mum actually threatens that she's got this um, video of me when I was 10 years old, uh, dressing up one of our um, family greyhounds with like yellow tea towels and like putting on my best David Attenborough voice and <laughs> pretending that she was a, you know, lion on the African savanna somewhere. <laughs> She's going to bust it out at any moment. But oh, I've I would love to see that. <laughs> I, think, I think she's bluffing, but um, fingers crossed she's bluffing. We can be... actually jump over to that video now. <laughs> she's sent it to <laughs> us. So. <laughs> I put it past her. <laughs> but, um, uh, that's amazing. I, my, my background is in um, technical diving and uh, under, underwater shooting as well. Um, and I guess I've kind of just always been really passionate about um, wanting people to, you know, fall in love with not just the underwater world, but the natural world as much as I've been and um, also be able to kind of engage in um, some of the topics around um, some of the more kind of uncomfortable topics around ocean conservation, right. um, but in a really fun and positive way um, uh, that's full of hope and um, solutions instead of just problems. So, yeah, I think I think as a, as a diver and as a filmmaker, I do kind of feel obligated to use my voice in that way to talk about things that I'm passionate about and have been lucky enough to um, find a couple of other people that feel the same way that will help me <laughs> to accomplish that. So hopefully we've done that in this film. That's amazing. Yeah. And you're joining us today from Australia. Um, so it yes. is actually very early on Saturday morning for you. Yes. So <laughs> the, um, the caffeine. Yeah. So thank you. What is the documentary 
film world like in Australia? I know just from the last couple of years working in giant screen that there are a couple of giant screen theaters. There are a couple of studios, but what does that climate look like for you as a filmmaker? Uh, I think when it comes to filming, we're incredibly lucky. You know, we have so many uh, really special and unique um, environments and locations on, on our back door. And every one seems to be really different from the other. So, you know, we're really spoiled for choice in terms of filming. Um, Melbourne IMAX, uh, I think, is our only IMAX screen at the moment. Um, Sydney is in the process of rebuilding. Right. So um, in terms of that, um, yes, when it finally comes to the point of being able to see the films on, on the big screen, you know, because we don't obviously have screenings there every day, it's, um, it's pretty special. But, yeah, in terms of the actual filmmaking, I think we're super spoiled here. And, you know, even um, during lockdown, we've been able to do a couple of local shoots, which has been really nice to get out of the house. Yes, <laughs> With all amazing. of our borders closed and everything so um but fingers crossed touch wood that won't be too much longer there you go um I have a question here uh our annual pass holders had the the privilege and and the, the opportunity to submit questions for you prior to this so I have a question here um from one of our pass holders Monty Monty is wondering how do you prepare for documentary shooting before your documentary actually begins so before you actually started going out to collect shots for sea lions what does it look like um to prepare for that um a lot of research um into behavior and, and locations and stuff like that um, i really learned just how crucial um the preparation side was on this film um, you know, our last film, Turtle Odyssey, was filmed in a lot of really beautiful um, tropical locations that didn't that had a lot of different challenges um, than sea lions. Sea lions was filmed off a really wild and woolly coast off South Australia uh, on some really remote offshore islands, um, which are pretty much only accessible by you know boat or helicopter. Right or the sea lions that live at the bottom of those incredible cliffs that we've um, seen in the film, you know, chunks of which just plummet into the ocean at any point. So, <laughs> and, and the islands themselves are, um, are in a body of water that was actually used in the film called Jaws. So there are some um, toothy uh, considerations <laughs> going on there as well. But, um, you know, I think research is the main thing and then it's, you know, finding people that um, are e experts in those areas that can help you along the way and, you know, getting the permits right and, and just being as prepared as you can also in terms of knowing exactly what you want to capture in terms of the scene and the sequence and the shots that are going to make up that sequence and, you know, what the light's doing and what the animals are doing and what the camera's doing. But I think also equally important is... Um, when you get onto location, it's just being able to surrender and just letting all of that go because <laughs> more often than not, you know, the sea lions don't follow our scripts and the animals don't follow our scripts. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not a cheap exercise, so you've got to give yourself the best shot at <laughs> getting, getting the behaviour that you need. But yeah. um, I think that's one of the, the most joyful things about what we do as well is that, you know, it doesn't always go to plan. And sometimes you get things that you weren't expecting that actually mould the film into a different direction. So I think the sea lions have actually had just as much input into moulding this film as um, as the directors have because, they yeah, they just definitely didn't do what they were, <laughs> they were asked most of the time. They definitely yeah. uh, come across. We have a... Um... We have a, a local species of, of sea lions here in British Columbia. Um, and so just from life experience of that and then from seeing your film as well, they definitely come across as relatively stubborn animals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have the smaller sea lions there, I think, which are the biggest species in the world, which are incredible. They're so amazing. And Do you they know just... how they compare in size to the Australian sea lion? Oh, now you're testing me. Sorry. Um, that just... <laughs> I don't I don't um bigger <laughs> yeah. 
That's that'll do. That'll <laughs> do. <laughs> they're, they're huge though. And they're, um, I've seen a lot of my colleagues have, have been diving off your coast and they just get absolutely swarmed by them, you know, biting at their um, camera equipment, their flashes and their dive suits and all that kind of stuff. So they've definitely kind of got the same cheeky personality. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back a little bit to to you getting involved in filmmaking. What so what came first? Did filmmaking come first or did diving come first? Uh, diving came first. Okay. And so, so it, um, did that determine then the route to sort of focus on more underwater subjects in cinematography? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So I started off um, teaching diving actually and then kind of got into technical diving and cave diving. Um, I did a lot of cave diving in Mexico and kind of um, – realized that there wasn't really enough critter action in caves for me and <laughs> I just wanted to be you know anywhere where there was um marine life that's really what interested me and then uh I went uh, back to university and did some studies in kind of film theory and that kind of stuff okay um not documentary but actually um you know kind of other features and stuff like that but uh, I was always, you know, in the water every chance I would, I could get. So I think that definitely um, formed the basis of uh, what was to come. And then I was really lucky to work on an underwater um, feature film, uh, conservation feature film called Blue, right. uh, which talks about a lot of um, issues in ocean conservation, um, marine plastics, single-use plastics and stuff like that and pollution. So that really kicked off... Um, my sort of passion for that type of messaging and um and yeah the rest is history so <laughs> not quite there's one piece <laughs> there's one piece of the story still missing which is how did you land on the topic of sea lions um you know i i definitely understand from what you've said so far as to how you ended up with a film focused on on conservation um and but why sea lions as the subject um, well, I think, you know, the, one of the things I really love about IMAX is it's such an incredible format to be able to inspire change and, and inspire action. And sea lions are an animal that are just the, the most perfect vehicle for that, you know, and they're, they're kind of a canary in the coal mine for our oceans. Um, and, and they're sending a really clear message, you know, they could be extinct in our lifetime. So the more research I did, I kind of um, realised that their story hadn't been told in this way, right. um, but it, it really needed to be and it was a really important one. So um, I saw an opportunity to, uh, my colleague and I, Paul, um, saw an opportunity to make a really fun, feel-good film that was also, um, you know, informative and good for people and good for the ocean and uh, ultimately good for the sea lions. Well, I think you definitely <laughs> accomplished that for the folks who have uh, been able to see it. I'm sure they would agree that it definitely fits that bill. You know, it is this um, light and fun and beautiful and playful film um, that sends a really important message about conservation. And I think the theme, we've done a, a series of these behind the scenes interviews so far and in asking um, that sort of similar question to giant screen filmmakers, I think there's a big theme about um, using the method of having people fall in love with something as a way to uh, inspire action in them, right? That we, we protect and we care about the things that, that we love. So using the giant screen as a format to make people fall in love with this Australian coast and these beautiful animals, I think makes perfect sense to me. In yeah, definitely. It's... Um yeah, ha having people emotionally connect after working on something for so long, having, you know, your pass holders and your audience members um, emotionally connect is really um, special for us to see because we're very invested <laughs> already. <laughs> it's very emotional. Paul and I are both very emotional people, so <laughs> we've been that way for um, uh, since this kind of the start of the process. So to see other people jump on board is amazing. And when did the process start, Amelia? Where when did this start taking taking shape? Oh, that's a good question. Probably um, 
close to two years now okay. from the research phase to um, to the release. So um, there was a lot of research that went into it and a lot of kind of logistical um, issues in, in being able to get out to the locations. Right. A lot of the land, um, you know, in the Nullarbor Desert along that Great Australian Bight has been handed back to the traditional landowners as well. So it was a lot of um, time-consuming uh, conversations that had to happen to actually be able to get access to those places because it's it's illegal to just walk on and start filming. So right. um, there was a lot of um, yeah conversations that needed to happen before we could actually turn on the cameras. But once we started filming, it all seemed to happen pretty quickly. Perfect. Um, and so I have a question here from Gwen, one of our past holders, just on the topic of the film sort of coming to completion. Um, since Gwen asks, since Sea Lions has come out, what changes have been made or noticed along the Australian coast? Okay, so uh, we were about 24 hours out from the Australian premiere of the film when the COVID-19 lockdowns, the government announced COVID-19 lockdowns came into place. So um, uh, Australians haven't really seen the film yet. <laughs> but um, I can tell you that uh, we've been really fortunate to par partner with the Marine Mammal Centre in um, Sausalito, San Francisco, who feature in the film, right. uh, to produce uh, education guides that um, accompany the film. So. We've had some really amazing feedback on those from um, schools and students and stuff like that, and they kind of draw um, themes from the film and explore them kind of in a in a more detailed way, which is um, amazing. And the other thing that I'm not sure if I'm um, probably not supposed to tell you, but I guess too late. <laughs> we won't tell anyone. We promise. <laughs> yeah. You didn't hear it here. It's just on live video, but. Um, Sam Neal, the amazing uh, adopted Australian, but he's actually a Kiwi actor, um, has narrated the film since um, all the lockdowns and everything have happened. So the next iteration that you guys see will have the sweet dulcet tones of Mr. Sam Neal. Amazing. Is, uh, there you go. Yeah. Well, everyone that has... Any will be excited. Exactly. <laughs> everyone that has seen it so far will need to come back uh, and see it with a new narration. <laughs> That's very exciting. Um, like Sam Neill is the only really kind of semi Aussie that's um, that's seen it and and he's enjoyed it. So <laughs> there you go. perfect. Well, it was enough to uh, convince one Australian. Um, so yeah. I'm sure it'll be be enough to convince the rest. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. The the next question I have is from uh, Avery, another one of our pass holders. Uh, Avery asks, do you have a favorite moment from filming Sea Lions? Oh, I think, you know, there are, there are always those days in filming where you roll off the back of the boat and there's just 25 meters visibility and the animals are doing what they should be doing the light's doing what it should be doing and the camera's working and you just like everything just comes together and they're few and far between but there were a couple of those days on sea lines that were just you know amazing experiences but I think my favorite my favorite moment is actually at the end of the process when we get to watch the fine cut um, with an actual audience because um, you know Paul and I sit together in a tiny room for so many months um, cracking ourselves up and you know we will <laughs> watch a scene and turn to each other and you know both have tears in our eyes and um, but you never really know if that's going to translate to anyone else until it's kind of too late so um, uh, getting to that stage and hearing people laugh where you've laughed and you know get emotional where you've gotten emotional is super relieving <laughs> and um, <laughs> super satisfying as well. So that's that's probably my favourite moment in the process. Was that the question? Yes, 100%. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> that was definitely a question. Um, yeah, that, that must be Terrifying. such a... <laughs> such a process like just thinking through how much energy goes into creating this 45 minute experience um and you know it's a 
when every moment is packed with such intent um, from you and the filmmaking team, I can only imagine um, when that intent sort of comes to fruition, um, the the feelings that that must create. I, uh, yeah, I get it, I think. Is yeah, that- and it's kind of easy for us to be so emotionally involved because, you know, we've been out on location with them for a year and, and researching them for another year, but uh, to pack that all into a 40 minute film and make pe- try, try and make people feel that same kind of emotional tug um, right. is a challenge, but I think that's my most, that's, that's my favorite challenge in making these films is yeah. to try and accomplish that. So hopefully we've done that. <laughs> totally. And where, <laughs> where did you find Dirk? So, so going uh, just for the folks who haven't seen it, um, the film follows the story of um, a sea lion pup, an Australian sea lion pup and sort of her journey and the obstacles that she faces being a sea lion. Um, and the human character is this amazing ranger Dirk, who is responsible for um being sort of the caretaker of the coast and, and the caretaker of the sea lion population. So how, how did you find him? Where did you find him? He is amazing. So I want to know more. He's amazing. He is really amazing. Um, so when I was kind of researching the film and starting to put together our first shoot blocks, uh, you know, the logistical kind of process of getting not just a person, but, you know, 400 kilos of camera equipment to these places just like was haunting my dreams on a nightly basis. And I knew that I I needed someone on the ground that could help. And um, so I reached out to Dirk um, because I knew that that was not just his specialty, but sea lions are his specialty. You know, this is his his jam in a sense. And he straight away offered to to take us out to a colony and and really help in whatever way he could. Um, It just so happened that we had really intense swell and winds the first day he took us out to an island and he almost killed us all but um, <laughs> it was it was amazing and it became really obvious that he would you know just do whatever he he needed to do to get the message of the Australian sea lion out to a wider audience but um, that was really inspirational but I think he was a little bit surprised when I called him back the next week and actually asked him to feature in the film he was like <laughs> just kind of, kind of stunned but um you know it's also important to mention that being in front of the camera for Dirk is like not his first second third fourth or fifth choice <laughs> in terms of what he would be doing he's you know the kind of person that doesn't even let his family take photos of him at Christmas so doing this was so far out of his comfort zone um but you know that was super inspiring to to be around someone that was <laughs> really you know just wasn't in his wheelhouse at all but saw an opportunity to get a really important story told and so you know said i'm i'm going to stand up and, and use my voice for the sea lions if i can and, and do what i can and so that was um inspirational but also terrifying because i really wanted to make the film you know, everything it could be for him as well because he put right. so much on the line to be involved. And, yeah, so that's uh, that's how we met Dirk. And hopefully um, when all the lockdowns finish, he'll be able to, you know, come around to the premieres and, and do a couple of interviews and, and meet all you guys. I know he's um, he did a little message for all your pass holders back yes. in November. But, yeah, and I showed him um, a really sweet reaction from everybody and he was just blown away. It's like, I can't believe it. This is happening. You know, he spends most of his work days alone on, you know, the longest uninterrupted cliff face in the world in the Nullarbor Desert. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of strange for him, but he's, um, he's loving it and he's really um, proud of the finished product, which is amazing. Totally. I don't you know, I don't want to, uh, contribute to any sort of unwanted, uh, Australian stereotypes. Um, but he is just so Australian (laughs) as a Canadian, sort of my perception of the sort of most extreme Australian that's him, you know, with his tan lines and just, I love him. I think he's great. And, um, it's so nice to hear that he's, he's in the film because, uh, because of his dedication to the species is makes it, um, an even more important, uh, role to fill. So. Yeah. Yeah. And actually 
since filming his um his scientific paper that he was working on with him, him and his colleagues when we were filming him um, has just been published, which is really exciting. So they're using drones to um, be able to map the, the BMI, the body mass index oh, of cool. all that the different colonies to be able to kind of get a, a better idea about the health of the individual colonies without having to go on with a helicopter and you know disturb all the mum and pups and stuff like that. So right. that's, that's really exciting for him. Um, yeah. That's amazing. um so I have a question here this is from me this isn't from a pass holder um I am curious to know uh when sea lions are your main subject matter what is the biggest challenge that comes along with filming um it was apart from the geographical (laughs) uh logistical nightmare it was um it was really tricky with them because they behave really differently on land to what they do in the water. So their eyes are actually specifically developed to be able to see underwater, unlike us. So they're, they're actually quite short-sighted on land and they're not the most, manu- they're a little bit manoeuvrable, but they're not the most manoeuvrable on land and they kind of know it. So when they see people, they're, they're a little bit more um, cautious, I guess, and a little bit a little bit more scared. So we had to behave really sort of respectfully of their personal space um, on land. But then as soon as we got in the water, it was, you know, they could instantly see how totally incapable we were in comparison <laughs> to them. And so all they wanted to do when we were in the water was just just play. And so um, kind of like your Stella sea lines, I guess, but, you know, they would just come up and, and bite at the expensive glass dome ports of, of which we went through about three, I think, during oh. filming because they just had big scratch marks down the front um but the challenge was getting natural behavior from them when they're just so interactive with you and they just want to play with you the whole time um uh so it, it took a lot of patience of just sitting there and kind of waiting for them to get bored of us I guess um and just start going off to do their own thing to be able to get that that behavior but um that was kind of an interesting and unexpected challenge because you think usually you know if the animal is there um eventually you're going to be able to you know film them doing their thing but these guys are you know they're as intelligent as a four-year-old human being right so their whole kind of mindset was that we were there to entertain them and they would just get super frustrated when we were just (laughs) sitting there in silence still and they'd kind of um, get annoyed and swim off and come back and but um, yeah, it got there eventually. But that was a surprising um, challenge and something I didn't really think of before we started. <laughs> yeah, no, I um, I can imagine that not being flagged as a as a potential outcome. And and also, uh, they're not very helpful because apart from so every different breeding colony that's spaced out along that Great Australian Bight uh, breeds at a different time of year. Okay. So, and not only that, but the mothers have a 17.5-month gestation period of their pups, which means the age of the pups on each island is different every year. <laughs> so every island is on their own individual breeding cycle, which because of the 17.5 months is different every year. Right. So trying to predict uh, what age the pups were going to be and what kind of behaviour they were going to be doing on each location um, was really tricky and there was a lot of guesswork um, involved. And sometimes, you know, they were doing exactly what we expected and sometimes there wasn't a single pup there at all. So right. um, that was that was a challenge for sure. Yeah, no. Totally. <laughs> great, for scheduling, great for scheduling purposes. Yeah, that's so strange that even along <laughs> one coastline, they're all on different cycles. That seems really unique. It is really unique and it makes Dirk's job very challenging to be able to count, you know, the pups in a breeding season because the seasons are specific to each colony. So right. Keeps them busy all year long. Keeps them busy all year long, yeah. <laughs> Not much time for surfing before Dirk. Yeah. <laughs> We've got that out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Amelia, I have a question here for you from Micah, another one of our pass holders. Um, Micah asks, this is a tough one. Um, (laughs) He asks, now that the film is done and out in the world, is there anything that you would change about it? 
Oh, God, I feel like Micah must be a filmmaker because whether, whether filmmakers admit it or not, I feel like there is always um, things that we wish we could change or things that we wish we could keep working on, you know, if there was an unlimited time or an unlimited budget. Um, but, you know, you just got to you just got to cut the cord eventually and, and let the little baby bird fly out of the nest and hope that it doesn't crash and burn in <laughs> most cases. But, you know, it's most of the changes, to be honest, aren't things that would affect um, the audience's experience or connection or um, story or anything like that. It's right. just, um, you know, little technical things here and there that, you know, you could push the schedule out by five years if if you wanted to. <laughs> well, I could anyway, but um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, money and time, are, um, uh, yeah, not unlimited. So, but yes, definitely, there always is. There's always changes. So, what's next? What uh, are you working on? Anything right now? Any ideas floating around that you're 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 thinking about taking more seriously? Uh, yes. So we, we have been doing a couple of little local shoots for our next project. Okay. So I don't think I'm allowed to talk about that that's one. that's but okay. We know eight, some things in some things two. in the works. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it potentially maybe for giant screens? Yes. Okay. There we go. All right. So we, <laughs> we will so watch. You're, for, you're stuck with me again. <laughs> there you go. Uh, in one more year, we'll do this same thing uh, and we'll see yeah. if you're able to answer that question then. Correct. Um, <laughs> so Amelia, I wanted to say thank you, uh, for a couple of things. One for joining us in Victoria last fall. It was an absolute blast to have you here on this side of the world, uh, to start launching sea lions life by a whisker. Um, a second wanted to thank you for the amazing film. Uh, it really is beautiful and so fun and just a really great way to transport ourselves to Australia and fall in love with that amazing sea lion species. And third, for slicing out some time on your very early Saturday morning to join us. Oh, okay, all the days are just blending into one. I actually thought it was Wednesday. So there, it's fine. It is Wednesday. You're right. <laughs> it right. is. <laughs> well, thanks. Pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, I wanted to end on one last question. Um, you've sort of answered it a little bit, but I just think it's a nice way to kind of wrap up. It's just to ask you, um, what do you love most about what you do as a giant screen filmmaker? Oh, finishing with the tough questions. <laughs> um, I think, you know, being able to give, you just give a voice to an animal that doesn't have one that really needs one. Um, and getting people to emotionally connect with that animal and with that cause in a 40 minute time frame in a way that wants that makes them want to you know take action beyond sitting in the theater right is is one of the most i think rewarding things for me there you go well that is a call to action for everyone who has already seen the film and folks who are intending to see the film um, to jump on the internet after this and see what you can do to uh, work to protect that species of sea lion as well as marine life in general and our own populations here in British Columbia. So thank you, Amelia. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and thank you to all the viewers who tuned in today uh, and will continue to tune in over the next couple of days to watch this video. We really appreciate your support. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much, Leah. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye.